Hi, I'm Randy Berry with Eagle Vistas. We teach uh, zero time ag students or old hand, old pro ag students to sharpen their saw. We're located down in Seaburn, Florida. I'd love for you to come see us. This is the second part of a series that I'm putting together on just kind of like uh, things you want to know about crop dusting but we're afraid to ask. Hope you find it entertaining or at least educational. Um, the first time we discussed the evolution of crop dusting, but this time we're going to talk about more the actual physics involved and what's happening with airplane spraying. And a lot of it is going to be a lot different than a tractor spraying per degree because we have a lifting mechanism, whether it be a helicopter or an airplane that throws it in, and I'll get into that in just a moment. In the aerial application, we basically have certain types of sprays and nozzles. A lot of them are used on the farm also. We have the flat fan nozzle, which is basically a, a nozzle that shoots a spray in a fan type of situation straight down. We have the hollow cone. The hollow cone actually sprays from the nozzle in the center, actually sprays just that. This is a hollow cone and these are all the spray droplets coming out of it. A deflection nozzle is your CP nozzles and Davidon triceps, basically where you have you, a orifice choice of three or four or five, whatever the case may be. You can change the orifice size by moving a dial, then it goes to a deflector. And the deflector on the other side, you can change whether it be a straight back, no deflection, maybe a, a 12 and a half degree deflection, and this would be downward. And the more deflection, the more shear, so the smaller droplet size you're going to get. The less deflection, the larger droplet size you're going to get. Rotary atomizers. Rotary atomizers, you've been probably heard them called Micronairs or ASCs or Trisets by David Don, something like that. Rotary atomizers are getting more and more popular for the simple reason is that they are a means, and they're nothing new actually, they were designed, Micronair designed them in England back in the 50s I believe, when they first came into effect for a lot of the stuff because we were just coming out of the dusting stage where dust just covers everything, so we still, they were still working on breaking it up to get really strong coverage and do the job, but they were less concerned back then with the drift and things that we have to do today. But there are things with a rotary atomizer that are unique. The neatest thing about it is a rotary atomizer usually has a wind-driven fan and a basket or something with holes in it or whatever and a check valve, okay, that's laid on the boom. When this rotor, in other words, the speed of this rotary atomizer is changed by these blades to spin it faster or slower. The faster this spins, the smaller the droplet spectrum. The slower it spins, the larger the droplet spectrum. And when it comes out of this screen like this, there is no shear because it's actually centrifugal forces slinging it out. So it has more chance of staying at the desired speed, or at the desired droplet size at the set speed than these other nozzles because depending on pressure and a lot of different things, it creates more fines because of more shearing. But a rotary atomizer, once you find out what speed to turn this to get whatever target range, let's just say we're looking for 150 to 250 micron droplets. Once we know the speed to spin that on, we're going to have 150 or to 200 micron, and 80% of them are going to be in that range. Okay, you're going to have very few bigger, very few higher, which is not the case with these other ones. However, the neat thing about this is if you were putting one gallon to the acre, you would have one gallon to the acre's worth of microns at 150 to 250 size. If you put out five gallons to the acre, you would have the microns still in this same range, but you just have a whole lot more of them. And then if you got into tree work, like we do in citrus down in Florida, lots of times we put out 15 gallons per acre. So what we're doing is just creating a whole lot more droplets of this size with a rotary atomizer. And that's what's so unique about it. Um, 
You can control the droplet size no matter how much volume goes through it, which gives you a lot more ability to uh, fit your particular spray need. And then we have dry work. Dry material, dry work does not use a fluid or a liquid. It's basically your dry fertilizers, your prilled fertilizers, uh, dust, seeds for cover crop, that type of thing. And it's a very simple spray. All it is is a slinger. It just basically has a throat that comes out of the hopper. Out of the hopper, it just gravity flows down to this throat, inside this throat. There's a bunch of veins that sling this material that drops here out. And the effect of swath is determined. And you'll notice that also when you're flying a spreader, because they're normally only about 8, 10 feet wide at the most, if you flew really low, you're, you would only get a small swath because you still have a lot of kinetic energy of this material still coming out. The trick is you want to fly high enough that all this material that's coming out has a chance to make, make its furthest extremity as far as the energy goes that it's carrying, and then just drops. And then once you have the proper overlap, then you have a good coverage. So it's a fairly simple system. Another thing with the physics of spraying, people have a misconception of helicopters and fixed wings. A lot of people, and especially helicopter people, will, will use it as a selling tool that a helicopter, because it has downwash from the rotor, the main rotor blade, that it penetrates the crop better and does better. And that is true only until this helicopter hits a speed called translational lift. Once this translational lift occurs, this, this rotor up here is no longer putting any more downwash than an airplane is. And it has vortices off of the ends of the tips of the wing that, that operate just like fixed wings. So in theory, once this helicopter starts going over about 40 miles an hour, 40, 45 miles an hour and hits translational lift, it's a fixed wing airplane. Only if he slows it down. And I've seen it in many, many situations, if he slows it down too much, you can get too much of a disturbance. And on some of your things like peanuts and maybe some of your uh, vine crops that with runners and stuff, especially the ones that pin, you can actually pull pins out of the ground and be counterproductive with it. So let me explain to you what translational lift is. Translational lift occurs First off with the helicopter, when it takes off with zero speed and it takes off vertically, most all the air is going straight down for every action. Lift is created, vertical component of lift is right there. Okay? So it's taking all the power in this engine, in this airplane, in this rotor, pushing up to bring it up off of the ground. Okay, that's great, except he's not going anywhere. As he starts going forward, notice that he has to tilt the rotor, which you'll see the tail come up a little bit, because now his rotor is looking like this, and the faster he starts going forward, now, instead of going straight down, this air starts going back. And the faster he goes until he hits translational lift, when translational lift is in, then the relative wind from this rotor is going to be just like a fixed wing airplane, if that makes sense to you. So that translation is, remember, it's still having to hold itself out of the ground until it has enough lift from its rotor going forward to have the forward speed. So as it translates, all the lift is downward, it lifts up, tilts the rotor, as he starts accelerating, you'll see that he can slowly bring his nose up because now he's flying level just like an airplane because that's all that rotary wing is. It does allow him to come in and land without a runway and that type of stuff. However, just like your combine, there's a whole lot of more parts moving in that thing and it costs a lot of money to operate a helicopter. They're time change items, they're not that fast in the first place, and 
the only way that they can even think about doing your crop spraying is that they have a nurse rig right there in that tank, in that field or close by, where he can, and he, once again, like we talked about in the first session with the satellites, every field is a satellite for a helicopter because he has to go out there spray, and he can't, he can't afford to be going somewhere else. That's why he also has to, because he has the equipment, and bring it here and spray in this field, that when he comes in and lands and loads and finishes everything up, he's staying right in here. He's still going to have to charge, generally, a couple of dollars an hour more than what a fixed wing will. And he will try to justify that by telling you he does a better job and all that stuff, and that's strictly up to you to decide. But as a proven fact, once the, airplane, the helicopter is past translational lift, it is an airplane. And, you know, it's been proven many, many times, and I'm going to tell you it's not. Um, and because it's slower, it can get in and out of a lot of different places, but airplanes are the same also. Kind of just like, let me explain that to you a little bit. Um, all right, let's just, for the sake of it, explain it like this. All right, we're going to put together a little corner here. Let's just imagine that you're in your automobile, and you're going 40 miles an hour, okay? Well, we're looking from above. This car is driving 40 miles an hour just like this, and I want him at 40 miles an hour to make as steep of a, as hard of a turn as he can to stay within this line and make this radius like this. So how close he can get and still make that radius right there at 40 miles an hour when we'll make a note of it, it's right there. So now let's go to 80 miles an hour, we'll double the speed. At 80 miles an hour, if he does this same radius turn, he's going to end up hitting this wall, isn't he? He's going to have to start turning way here to make more of a rounded arc to counteract that centrifugal force that's trying to push him to the outside of the turn because he's going so much faster, right? All right, with the same concept now, let's just think of it as an airplane. Now let's look at a small, slow airplane, ICAP, Pawnee, going 80 miles an hour, 90 miles an hour at cruise. Except now this isn't a wall, these are trees at the end of the field. Notice that a slower airplane is going to be able to get closer, stay lower, longer, get closer, and still be able to pull up and clear these trees. Whereas at 80 miles an hour, you're going to have to start way back here and make more of that. So you're not going to get quite as good a coverage on the corners unless you come around and make a whole bunch of extra trim up passes at the end. And people don't hardly like to do that anymore. You know, I, I wouldn't have any, any other way but there's a lot of people who figured it's not. They have a crop hawk and they have their computer that tells them exactly how much it goes in and that's the way it is. But this is the concept of the fixed wing in the helicopter. Which one does the best job? The one has the best pilot, period. That understands the concepts. They're both equally as good. However, you are going to pay usually two to three dollars an acre more for a helicopter, because of the added expense and operating expense of the thing, than you will for a fixed wing airplane, which is very important if you're thinking about owning your own. And maintenance, uh, you better be planning on doing it yourself or having a, a lot of work that you can afford a good mechanic to stay with you. Okay. All right. Next, we're going to just take a look here of how a wing works. And wing, I say wing. Believe it or not, a wing-type airfoil is used in many places. The wing of a fixed wing airplane, the main rotor of a helicopter, the tail rotor of a helicopter, and the propeller of a fixed wing airplane are all wings. They're all airfoils that create lift. If we are looking from the end in, this is what makes an airplane fly. You have a leading edge, a trailing edge. 
when the wind hits this wing, it can't go through it because it's hard surface. It has to separate here. Air goes over the top. Air goes over under the bottom. It goes faster over the top because it has to hit here at the same time and has less distance on the bottom. So, because of that, the faster you go and the more air you have going over this, the more low pressure is created. Very much like a Venturi in a carburetor. Okay, where you have your jet that, 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 uh, that puts the fuel air mixture into the carburetor, go into your manifold. Well, this is just a half of that. So it's creating low pressure here, static pressure or higher pressure here, and the resultant is lift. Now, the faster you go, the more lift is created to the point where when the airplane and all that it's carrying and all the load it's carrying and the people in it, the fuel and everything else, there's enough lift, this airplane or this airfoil will fly. So whether it's a helicopter going round and round or an airplane going through the air, this is what makes it do it. Propeller the same way, except for propeller works like this. The engine's turning it, and it's lifting forward instead of up. So, it's a little concept. And then the surfaces that we use on this either make it longer and more pressure on the bottom, further to go on the top, lower pressure, we create the lift. When the other flexion goes up, it destroys some of the lift because it doesn't have as far to go. Okay. Now, that's looking at the end and the concept of it. Now, let's look at the airplane coming at us. And let's take a look at the wings. All right. When this airplane is going through the wing, through the wind, just like this, and we know it separates here at the leading edge, goes over the top, so we're creating low pressure here, higher pressure here. This works great because low pressure here, high pressure here. Now, when we get to the end of the wing, this high pressure, and you'll notice also, depending on how low, the lower you go to the ground, you have a an, called ground effect. The lower you go to the ground, you also have a squeezing of the air between the wing and the ground, called ground effect, and it causes this compressed air or this higher pressure air to actually push out. It can't go in, so it's, it kind of pushes out a little bit naturally. Once it gets out to about two-thirds of the wing, and this is why you see the new boom stop right here, this high pressure and the movement of this air starts coming in and it's high pressure always replaces low pressure. Just like in our weather systems and what causes the weather, high pressures and low pressure. High pressure will always overtake low pressure. Low pressure up here, so this is what's causing that spinning or vortices, tornado looking thing at the end of the wings. This is where your fines occur your fine drop of size, and this is what constitutes the drift, so in which we've got to be more and more prevalent on drift and drift performance. So it's very smart to eliminate a lot of spray particles in this vortices area, because especially if you're doing herbicide, weed killers, because you can get drift that could go over there to something that's not a weed, like alfalfa, and do hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of damage if you're not careful. So this is how it works. This is how, it, how the concept is arrived. So they say, do you, does it get a better swath when you're flying higher or lower? Well, that's a good question too. Remember, the lower you fly, the more compression you have. So you actually can see it's starting to go out a little bit. Like it has to go somewhere, right? It won't compress anymore. It starts moving out. So you're actually aggravating the high pressure to the low pressure. If you're higher, you have less chance of it getting into this, and the further you put your nozzles inboard, the less chance you have of getting into this. In other words, if we had a very short boom from there to there, we would have hardly any vortices at all. It would never reach it out there. It would all be under the high pressure, and it would all be downward. It wouldn't be outward, and it wouldn't be upward. So on the trailing edge of the wing, 
where we put our booms, we try to keep them down the best we can for a trailing edge boom where our nozzles set and spray. But you'll notice that the high pressure is already gone and the low pressure is going to be about right here. So it has that tendency, this low pressure has a tendency because the high pressure is coming up, right, to actually pick it up and that's why it comes in. Whereas if you were in board here, you eliminate that concept because all it has is the low pressure or the higher pressure on the bottom, excuse me, right here, pushing it down. And this is something that we're experimenting right now with, with many different things. And uh, of course, that's the, probably the, the best thing and the, the, the reports that I get from farmers or co-ops of two or three farmers together that get together to have three, four, or 5,000 acres and buy a small airplane and one of them learns how to fly it or one of the boys or whatever, keep it on the farm. Doesn't have to be a commercial operation. Gives you the ability to start playing and figuring out what spray system works the best for you, what swath works the best for you, what speeds work the best for you. How do you get, because Mr. Farmer, you're mostly interested, and this is where the conflict arises, okay, quite truthfully, is you have two main intents. Mr. Farmer, you want to get the best yield so that you can sell it at the market and get the best net profit at the end of the year. That's your main concern. Mr. Spray Operator here is mostly interested in gross acres that season. He wants to do as many acres as he can because the more acres he does, he does it. So there's a little conflict here because once again, what I've already showed you, that slower constitutes a better swath and it's better for you Mr. Farmer, faster is better for the airplane operator because he can do more acres, okay? I don't know about you, once again, he's, it allows him to keep his prices down a little bit. I will say this, you know, I mean this sincerely, if you have an operator that you've been dealing with as a farmer that does good work on time, you have no problems with him whatsoever, he has good equipment, and you've got a relationship with him, you would be a fool to do anything else and try to do anything yourself to save a little bit here and there. If you're not completely happy with who's doing your work and how they're doing your work and you don't really feel that he's a business partner, he's more of just an uh, opportunist, then I assure you that I can show you the benefits. In fact, that would be one of my next uh, speaking points, that nobody's going to take better care of your farm than you, Mr. Farmer, and I can show you how you can save money doing it yourself. Not so much in the dollar, two dollars, or three dollars that you might save over a commercial operator, or, or more than that actually, but in the end of the year when the yields are coming in and everything's paid off, you're going to have more money in your pocket, and that's the name of the game for you. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you on the next visit. Bye.